Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Ariane Hanemeyer, and my colleague at CNN Atlas and I um, organized this panel as part of the Crash 20 anniversary um, set of events. Um, this panel is part of the Global League of Humanities. It's the second day. Thanks again to Yusuf Tot and everyone who joined yesterday for the in person movement and participatory workshop. Uh, today, we um, are going to have a panel moderated by Adam Christensen. Um, uh, and we'll have a we will, uh, get started. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm going to um, hopefully share my screen now. So um, for the sake of time, I thought I'd start with three scenes uh, that I hope evoke the potential and the challenges of what I'm calling decolonial presencing. And this is really drawing from a range of discussions and methods that have been innovated by those in the arts and activist movements, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and also Black Studies scholars. To, and these methods are really to make felt the shape of what is lost or is withdrawn from milieus. And I'm gonna be particularly giving attention to the leaning in of colonial histories into diasporic health, illness and debilitation. And in terms of the theoretical kind of frame, I've been, you'll see kind of hovering around in this presentation, um, Elizabeth Freeman's idea of what she calls chronocathocresis. So cathocresis is the um, when a word is used incorrectly. And so this is the, her idea about how time, dominant hegemonic modes of time are kind of used differently. And a key part of her analysis is her advocacy of what she calls sense methods as really temporal reroutings and a shattering of dominant forms of perception through which we understand ourselves and others. So I just, these three scenes I hope will make this less abstract. So scene one, this is an installation called Visceral Canker. Over 30 years ago, Donald Rodney's installation was exhibited in a disused gun battery in Plymouth, which is a port city in Southwest England. As you can see, the work is dominated by these huge two wall mounted heraldic shields, one of Elizabeth I and the other of Sir John Hawkins. And Hawkins was a second cousin of Francis Drake and England's first slave trader. He's known for really establishing the triangular slave trade between um, England, Africa and the Caribbean and the Americas in the latter part of the 16th century. Rodney, who died of sickle cell disease in 1998, completely worked with the materials and semiotics of his body. So he would often use x-rays, electric wheelchairs, different parts of his medical treatment, as well as his body, such as skin. Um, and he used art to mediate the intimacies and abstractions of bodily life. And visceral canker, as you can see, it was designed so that silicone tubes were supposed to be attached to a blood bag and an electrical pump, pump that would circulate Rodney's diseased blood across the shields. And he's really kind of, for me, creating this queer, uncanny kinning. And the circulation of histories in visceral canker is deeply moving a return to hidden relationships that Rodney puts into play as if his very life depended on it. So in listening to Visceral Canker, as Tina Camp might urge us to, and in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic that has uncovered the hidden extents of our global interdependencies as well as colonial legacies, I cannot help but hear the words of the American Eritrean poet, Aracelsus Gamay, let us name every air between strangers reunion. I start here because this installation materializes questions that I've long been struggling with. What does it mean to think of social justice and biology together 
and within the context of all sorts of scales of loss and mobility. And visceral canker just kept returning to me since the summer of 2020, really. Um, I want to move on from this kind of scene setting of thinking about chronocathacresis, Elizabeth Freeman's term, and to come directly to more my, to my research and, and my work on diasporic dying with migrants who are dying. It's mainly post-World War II migrants from the so-called Commonwealth who are now dying and aging. And in this vignette, it's a dramatized vignette that I made with the Tamasha Theatre Company, you will hear Hashini describing some of the symptoms of her mother's dementia. Her mother, Nirmala, had been a migrant to Uganda from the Gujarat and had then come to England as a refugee in 1972. Um, this was the expulsion of, East, uh, of Asians from East Africa by Idi Amin. So there's a kind of double diaspora going on in this piece. At times, there are difficulties for us. Although she is here, in her mind, she always thought she was back home. She's always talking about India. She'd wake up early in the morning and tell me, I'm going to the fields. And uh, she would open the door and walk out. And that was really scary for us. Uh, it happened a number of times that she had opened the door and walked out and got lost. On a few occasions, we had to involve the police to find her. She would walked about two miles away from home. Then I went away on holiday and uh, my brother took the decision to put her into a care home because his family were finding it difficult to look after her. He didn't ask me what I thought or what I wanted to do. My mother is a very religious person. Without fail, she would go to the temple, do her daily puja. Even today, although she's not aware of uh, what she's doing with uh, her hands, without the mara in her hands, her, her fingers, her hands are still working as if she's praying. And the other thing is, my mother was very strict about food. Food was not allowed from outside, not even bread. Now she, she doesn't even know what she's fed on. She doesn't even know what she's eating. She eats whatever is given to her in the care home. She, she finds it hard to express herself. And without the language, she's totally in her own world, totally shut down. Day by day, she's becoming weaker. So I just want to have a pause here for a minute to take in that scene. And one reading of it for me, and I've listened to this a few times and I pick up different senses from this, but stories such as Hashini's suggest how at times of illness and dying, the migrant body can find novel outlets for different forces of mobility both effective and material. When I listen to that, my heart breaks at her mother's fingers working the ghostly mala beads. So she hasn't got the beads there. And this is another sense method when we might think about ritual. So the beads lose their obdurate thingness, but they still have meaning, perhaps in the muscle memory of fingers. So, Really what strikes me as well in the wondering is how bi biology produces or at least makes more palpable these eerie holograms of other worlds. 
And it's not only a physiological event in this, in this story, but Hashini's mother also produces space and time by collaging and making present these disparate forces and sensations. And with these kind of recognitions of the movement between bodies and disease, I think we come to much more interesting and complex questions of identity. Not so much who are you, or in the case of some of us, where are you or what are you, but when are you? When are you? So these all, this story and thinking about diasporic dementia and conditions such as hallucinations, delusions, for example, bring us to matters of temporal otherness and migrations where a body or person can stay in place, but they bring disparate times and places to them. So I want to suggest that these liminal interstitial states of experiencing and consciousness in uprooted death and dying offer entry points into the possibilities and challenges of recognizing the biosemiotics of milieus through attention to different forms of mobility, loss and pain that can be surfaced through disease. So I'm really thinking about how neurology and biochemistry might loosen normativity or perhaps act as a buffer against normativity. And the final scene I want to come to is from a participatory project that's just finishing with street sex workers um, in South Africa, developed and supported by uh, scholars in the University of Cape Town in collaboration with the NGO SWET, which is the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force. And in this project, what um, we did was held, um, so the sex workers are now forming an independent theatre group, but they produced a WhatsApp soapy. So um, WhatsApp is the most popular messaging um, platform in South Africa, and they use it a lot. And through theatre performance workshops, they develop this own, their own soapy. So these are just some scenes. So you could get on your, if you signed up to the SOPI, you could get images, poetry, uh, messages, as well as performances. So this is a message, um, one that they would often send actually, what happened to so-and-so. So the WhatsApp SOPI also included know your rights kind of voice notes too. Um, and this, clip really brings me to the role of pleasure in social justice work. And I think we tend to tell, me included, really miserable stories about social justice. So I want to think about decolonial joy as a form of presencing. And um, decolonial joy is a term that's been developed by Francis Negron Mutana. And she really talks about and this is a wonderful project that she did um, with an ATM. She developed a different currency um, and developed an ATM that where the notes were um, popular uh, people in the history of Puerto Rico and people queued up and they gave a story for the notes. So I want us to think about decolonial joy and also thinking about um, what Adrian Murray Brown has called pleasure activism. So is it possible for us to also think about decolonizing in relation to pleasure and joy? And so what I'm just gonna finish off with, um, yeah, I've got a couple of minutes, is the street, what's called the strange dream dance. And you'll see this performed by Aquila who wanted to be a ballet dancer and had taken ballet, ballet lessons as a child. For me, their dance is also a temporal diffraction. By way of context, the scenes from this, this scene that you'll see from the Soapy were filmed on the grounds of the University of Cape Town, which is an incredible campus, and the Theatre Arts Admin Collective, which are not spaces usually taken up by street sex workers. And they were all at first a bit awestruck and a little intimidated by even being in these spaces. And Aquila's dance, and because I'm in Cambridge, I'll say mucks up what queer theorists would call chrononormativity. 
through a dream renewed and reenacted on the very grounds of paths not taken. So a central theme in queer temporality scholarship is what Jack Cabblestone calls the heteronormative life schedule, or what Sarah Ahmed theorizes as the lifeline which is the idea that a life should encompass certain events that need to take place at a certain time and in a certain sequence. So for me, Aquila's dance questions and plays with the effects of temporal attributions such as child development, untimeliness, and growing up in post-apartheid South Africa as a poor trans and coloured, as mixed race people are called, person. So I just want to end with this. just run over so um thank you thank you so much for a very stimulating presentation I um just to remind everyone we are uh, uh now we are moving on to Marianne Hackner who will be uh presenting for Brandon University Crouch and University of Edison who is working on uh on the United space for people uh, there. Okay, so I'm going to, we're in this hybrid zone. So thanks everyone for bearing with us. I'm going to share from here, which I hope will be all right. Okay, so the presentation is a chapter from my new book called Governing an Impossible System, A Critical Sociology of Public Health. I'm going to provide a snippet, very short, um, it kind of, way of thinking about um, this particular problem, it's the problem of space or the milieu um, in one particular uh, case study. So the book in general provides what I believe are two interventions in the health humanities uh, and specifically the global biopolitics literature. So the first is the idea of a congealment of a rationality about healthcare mechanisms that shifts the political gaze away from population health as its object of governing and toward the stability or the stabilizing of institutional mechanisms of regulation like the healthcare system. The second is to connect public health policy, like our understanding of it, with an apparatus of security. Security then deploys particular techniques of knowledge, such as epidemiology, to establish the elements within a field and the field of intervention itself, the milieu. Within that field are regulatory mechanisms that enable and constrain the life of the population in light of certain problematized objects. With the retrenchment of funding and budgets from government, there are constantly also impeding threats from not only the system, but also outside the system, as we have just recently observed with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I should say that I wrote this book um, before the pandemic, and then the pandemic made me come back to all those ideas and really uh, rethink them, which I will happily talk about um, later as, as well in the Q&A. So here, I want to understand how this nexus of choice becomes central within the milieu of public health as it is constituted. Uh, in the presentation, I'm going to try to answer that question very, very briefly. Um, I'm going to present one technology of public health security. Um, and if you want to know why I connect this idea of security and technologies with policies, please, again, ask me in the Q&A. Um, but the policy I'm going to study is caring for people, which emerged in England in uh, 1989. To make my argument, I'm going to uh, engage in a kind of critical sociological genealogy to deploy Foucault's analytic of power. And I'm going to briefly explain this with a diagram 
Then I'll present a case study of this policy period for people, which will satisfy particular elements, uh, uh, which will let us know that it is a, a part of a security apparatus. And I'll conclude by reassembling the diagram. So in 1989, the government published this paper, which was intended to reply to issues raised in the Griffiths Report, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Caring for people, community care in the next decade and beyond, the, uh, as a paper redefines the role of government in providing care. The opening words, quote, helping people lead full and independent lives. And that the greater part of care has been and always will be provided by family and friends sets the tone for a reduction in the role of government within and beyond the health service in providing community care. While some local authorities across the nation welcomed what they perceived at the outset as an empowerment to manage their own districts and allocation of resources, the effectiveness of the policy would turn out to be undermined by a number of different uh, invested interests. A decade following the policy's implementation, researchers uh, Means and Smith found that the policy was no better than the system it aims to replace. To replace, um, and so I want to briefly shed light on some of the social conditions that enabled the policy to be created the way that it was, uh, but also uh, talk a little bit about what I believe led to its failures. Um, and so. Here we have uh, a number of different uh, elements that I consider to be a part of a dispositif building, not only on the work of Deleuze, Foucault, but also Ron John Paul Dada. Uh, and this notion of a dispos dispositif is about the combination of assemblage of a number of different elements. The first being uh, particular institutions, and as we'll see, this will have to do with caring spaces of care, whether that's the home or whether it's the hospital, different domains or milieus of social life. Also, um, surveillance or monitoring uh, in, um, institutions, and these will rely on the expertise of epidemiology. Policy programs like caring for people that become installed in particular institutions which will have effects, both successes, meeting the targets of those policies, but also their failures. Um, and I probably won't get a chance to really get into the last one, but this is really where we can start to see the congealment of, um, of policy in England about public health uh, within the security apparatus because it enables or perpetuates or reproduces certain types of social inequalities. So even the failures, even this policy as a failure allows the system to go on in a particular way. So I'm gonna, I just want to just over, give you that overview, but that leads me into the diagram here, which you can also see from this excellent diagram, my amazing Microsoft Office skills. So here uh, is the first element in the diagram. It is, um, it, in a way, Foucault calls it the blind events of power, also non-discursive practices, or basically you can think about it as the things that happen in social spaces, uh, in institutions, in various milieus, people and things doing stuff. It's very, very simple. Uh, that. But then something happens, there's an event, there's some kind of, uh, maybe many events, maybe some kind of activity, something that's problematized. Uh, Thomas Osborne and Nicholas Rose refer to this as a process that shows how at each moment in history we have a precise set of problems that are the target of thought and action. So what the problematization is, as we'll see, is in discourse, something becomes defined as a problem, and that is often defined through science, through particular scientific discourses, as we'll see. And once we define problems, of course, we then know what we need to know and also what we need to do. So the juridical elements here about what should we do now, when we're talking about governmental policy, this usually is to install some kind of policy program with a target, with a goal, and it needs to be installed in particular institutional spaces in order to shape the activities of individuals or things, the circulation of things within that space in order to meet those particular targets. Now, this is where Foucault would say, or even Deleuze, even in his book on Foucault, this is where it kind of goes back around, right? We kind of, then we have this new policy program that organizes the activities of people and things, and we are back into just that first element. However, all policies, of course, have their effects. 
Um, they may or may not be successful. They may or may not fail in particular ways. Um, but it is where this particular um, thing happens, where these where it becomes usage of dominant groups that we see the congealment of the apparatus of security, um, which I really want you to ask me about later. Uh, but anyway, so just to kind of set the scene, I did the book, uh, the research for this book uh, through historical and archival methods, which I also would love to tell you more about. I love talking about my methodology. Um, but I really think we should just briefly set the scene or la mise en scène here about why this policy is created. Like what kinds of knowledge and problematizing elements emerged. So Roy Griffiths um, had originally been engaged by Thatcher government in 1983 to chair a report on manpower or the inclusive term I like to use, staffing. Um, the report resulted in an evaluation of the management of the NHS and its recommendations sought to improve the costs associated with the health service. Now, while the calls for action in the report were more in tall with managerialism, and there's a great deal of research that tries to connect it to this uh, emergent field of managerialism, I also think that um, the report sets the scene for particular governmental actions or ways of thinking about problems that are to come. So management, he wrote, when tasked with finding areas to reduce or cut costs, should always be looking elsewhere. It is the responsibility of management to conduct a search for areas that might be contracted out to the private sector. NHS management should continually be asking itself how services are organized, considering whether particular NHS functions could be performed by the same standard, very important, um, for, uh, outside of its service for less costs. And if they don't do that, if they keep it kind of in-house, they need to have a good justification for doing so. So Griffiths finds in the report that there is more money coming from government going into residential care, places of residential care, rather than to at-home services. So people who want to care for their kin or their family members at home. And what he argues in, in his report is that this incentivizes people to move into government funded institutions. So Griffiths instead proposes that the local health authorities should be given a new kind of power, a new kind of authority over their budgets. It gives them both the uh, budgets for at home care as well as institutional care. So it makes them have to decide on the basis of their districts, the needs of the people there, and they're supposed to make these, um, these decisions. So the underlying rationale of this report is that if the authority of the decision happens at the local level, in the actual district, the ge geopolitical space, this will then um, discourage people from moving into uh, uh, residential care facilities because there'll be more money going into the at-home care facilities, the day, you know, the, the day services, the in-home uh, services. So the care space comes to be problematized this way. The mobility and distribution of those elements within the field, the space of care, the circulation of people in and out of care, in and out of the home. And the local health authority is supposed to impose on the spaces of care these new policies or new ways to regulate its populations and bring about a much more desirable state of affairs, which of course is less costs. So there's an interesting sleight of hand that happens in caring for people, which is a response to this. So caring for people takes this report, responds to it, and it, it's the opening pages cites a great deal of information, primarily about expenditures. And it takes the last few decades of care and shows that health services have seen a great, a great increase in home services, which is great. However, there's a problem. The report states that there's been a bias in government investment. It's investing in nursing homes and not in people, not in individual people living in those spaces. Now, what I find really interesting is that there's no community-based research to support the effects of this, right? They're just like, we've been so biased, we're just paying for people, we could be helping you as individuals. So the sleight of hand here is, a, this is, I think, the omission of research about community need, but justification for the policy 
is based on this link between community need, of which there is no information, and expenditure. So it's placed already within this discourse about cost. So on the one hand, you have the problematization of caring spaces and their environments, and on the other, it comes to connect up with economic assessment of efficiency and function of those caring spaces. So because of time constraints, I'm just going to give you a few takeaways, um, it, but I really want to draw your attention here to the first two um, elements here, which is that um, the policy assumes that, that people who live with different abilities um, are not fulfilling their civic potentials because they're not given the resources to do so and in the home basis. Um, also that um, people who care for others do so voluntarily. It's on the basis of their choice. Neighbors and families want to help. They want to be able to stay home. So there are these natural givens within the care, which is people will occasionally have disabilities that they have obligations they may not live up to, and that people want to care for them in the home. Now, I think the, the other two elements to take away are the overall goals which is to support carers for the least possible cost, to promote third-party sector services for in-home care, and to introduce only those mechanisms into the NHS, only those types of um, care services that are economically viable. So we have problematization here, which includes two different elements. We see the kinds of expertise, the kinds of ways of expressing these as cost-related problems. Um, but also really important here is to think about this, and I won't go too far into this, but thinking about Foucault's notion of the police, which is that in order to make this politicization, you have to be able to keep looking, you need to keep understanding what is going on. And so what is enlisted here is um, the knowledge from different types of epidemiological and statistical surveys that keep track of or monitor the, uh, what is going on, who has disabilities, who's using what resources, and this becomes problematized over time, and the social service inspectorate is created. Now, I'm just I'm only a few minutes. This is fun because I'm, I'm doing well. Okay, so caring for people, I argue in the book, is um, fulfills certain elements of a security apparatus because it meets three different criteria. And so there's, there's three. The first is that uh, this policy places I, um, the problematized elements like expenditure is also the use of care services within a series of probable events. So if there are these natural givens, how is it that things unfold over time? So the primary technique by which the um, function of the space is placed within this series of probable events is through ongoing assessment. Under the new policy, the local health authority um, it is given the power to determine how people come to gain access to benefits. Um, what are the resources that they need to, which services, um, how they progress through the system, um, how they are discharged, what are the standards that need to be met in order to stay in or to be put back into the care home. Um, and so it's, it's in tracing this course of events um, that those in need of future increases or as they hope decreases in access to um, national health service uh, care are, um, are carried out by this new inspector, the social services inspector. So we now plays an active role in inspecting the plans, monitoring performance and offering advice and guidance about how people gain access and where these resources should be spent. So their goal is to take account of the needs of people who have been in hospital a long time and to help them re-establish themselves away from institutional settings. So i.e., there are people already living in these spaces, and if we want to move into a kind of third-party model, we need to find a way to move them home. The, um, the other thing that's you know, quite important uh, in terms of the, the movement of uh, expenditure as being the primary kind of um, uh, objective criteria that's guiding a lot of this policy um, program is that at the very same time, the Community Care Act of, of, uh, comes into play nationally um, in England. And so this ushered in contemporaneously with caring for people changes the relationship fundamentally between health authorities and service providers. 
Um, because the NHS is conceived in this, in this CARE Act as a service that government supports, it's only required to provide the means of provision, it says, not the actual provisions themselves, which is a really important shift. It's, massive, it's a massive shift from, from the previous act, which is that the service itself should provide those services, whereas now it's about just facilitating services. So it, re it shifts the grounds there, and it places the, um, the local health authorities into a role of purchasers rather than providers, and they then are able to, um, with their budget, search out those providers from the private care um, uh, uh, milieu. So this, we can see from the command papers that there's an increase in income to support the limits um, of the system, and specifically for to keep people in their homes. So there's a shift here in how it is that um, it's defined and how it has to enter into this particular type of cost calculus. And finally, is the establishment of a bandwidth. So anytime we think about policy is that we have a kind of normalization of a curve, not only an expenditure, but also the use of those services. So the policy required that research should be constantly happening, right? This, that this, not only we have this monitoring system, the inspector, but also the idea that that government should be actually enlisting researchers like statisticians, epidemiologists, community medicine, public health disciplines in order to constantly be studying what is happening in the population and in those spaces in order to inform the standards of care. And this then becomes a standard also for the inspector to go into these third party uh, um, institutions and be able to say, okay, so this is, a, this is good enough. It meets what is the kind of normal standard of care for these types of facilities. And to, to um, think about this, um, De Vries calls this the kind of intersection of the indeterminacy of life, who in does and does not need care, but also it necessitates this ongoing production of knowledge of how services already operate and how they should be used, what the threshold should be in order for the um, goals of the strategy to come about. So I'm just going to conclude really briefly here, since I'm, I'm definitely at time, um, which, is, which is just that um, the effects of this policy, uh, as I've already mentioned, is that it actually doesn't decrease costs. However, it does have uh, impacts um, in, in terms of the actual lives of people who are being shifted from in kind of residential care into um, uh, at-home care, uh, which, uh, which I, I document a little bit more in the book, but just to kind of go back through the diagram, which is what I want to kind of demonstrate in terms of uh, in terms of the overall argument here, is that we start with these um, things that are already known going on in the, the particular spaces of care at home in institutions, the problematization of the use of services and expenditures, which leads to a whole bunch of knowledge that gets produced ongoingly, not only by monitoring, but also by the, uh, by the surveys, by government, and especially about costs. Solutions, of course, are to incentivize people to stay home by giving them access to tax benefits, to audit, um, to use those kinds of auditing regulations to find those third-party cheaper versions than what the providers of the NHS can do themselves. The policy gets installed with this monitoring system or the file political police, and it gives the local health authority new kinds of uh, targets and authorities. So um, I'll stop there. This is my book, just because I thought, why not? Shameless plug. Uh, and, um, and thanks to uh, the Brennan University Research Council and the Faculty of Arts and Tyler Burnett. Thanks.